Welcome everyone to Bitcoin Optech Newsletter 296 recap on Twitter Spaces. Today we're going to talk about the great consensus cleanup soft fork. We're going to talk about a call for new BIP editors and our usual coverage of releases, release candidates, and notable code changes. I'm Mike Schmidt. I'm a contributor at Optech and executive director at Brink. Merch. Hi, I'm Merch. I work at Chaincode Labs. I currently look a lot at package relay and other wallet, Bitcoin core stuff, and outreach stuff. Antoine? Yeah, uh, I'm uh, Antoine Poinceur. I'm the co-founder of Wizard Sardine, uh, working mostly on the Liana wallet, and I've been working on Bitcoin core for the past years as well. Thanks for joining us today, Antoine. The first news item that we're covering is related to your post to Delving. We titled it Revisiting Consensus Cleanup on the newsletter. And you posted to Delving that you've been revisiting BlueMath's great consensus cleanup soft fork proposal from, I think, 2019. Maybe you can help frame for the audience what is the great consensus cleanup and how bad are the bugs that the proposal attempts to address? Yeah. Um, so the great consensus cleanup is a proposal from Matt Corano from five years ago now. Um which was about closing a number of vulnerabilities in the Bitcoin protocol, which necessitates a soft fork. So I started looking into it with the objective of determining how bad the bugs that it intends to fix actually are, um, how much the mitigations that it proposes actually improve the worst case or improve the situation in general. And given that it's been five years already, if there is anything else that we could have come up with that would be worth f fixing, and if there is a better way of fixing the bugs uh, in the original proposal. So maybe I can go over the bugs quickly. Um, so the first one that I detailed is the time warp bug. I think this one is always a bit uh, underestimated. It's been it's been discussed forever uh, in Bitcoin, and since it seems that it can only be exploited, or at least that there is only an incentive to exploit it for a fifty one percent attacker, uh, it's been overlooked. But so yeah, what it is first, um, the time warp vulnerability allows a majority hash rate attacker to, to reduce the difficulty at which to mine blocks in order to mine blocks uh, faster. And as the attacker mines the blocks faster, uh, he will be able to further decrease the difficulty. So that's, that's really the big thing with, with time warp. You can... In Bitcoin, you can always hold back the timestamps, right? There is uh, there is rules in the uh, to constrain the miners how the the miners set the timestamps, which is that uh, a timestamp may not be uh, more than two hours in the future at the time the node receives the block, and the timestamp of the block must not be. Um, lower no it must be higher strictly higher than the median of the past 11 blocks so that's the only things that constrain the timestamp of the blocks and so miners can always try to hold back the timestamps in uh, in bitcoin blocks but they're not going to achieve much they're going to fake the time in the in the past so they won't be able to uh, enable uh, future time locks before and if they start uh, trying to reduce the difficulty, as soon as they try to do it, the difficulty is going to moon back up immediately. It's not the case with time warp. With time warp, as the attacker ex reduces the difficulty, he will be able to reduce it even faster and faster and faster up until he gets back to a difficulty one, at which point he can basically uh, kill the, the chain. Um, it obviously um, changes the well. It obviously creates issues with time locks because then with a fifty-one percent attacker which exploits 
the time warp will never it you can uh, uh, expire all the time locks in Bitcoin. So obviously all the protocols relying on time lock will be broken. Also, it creates um, new vectors for spam because what the the only limit on the size of the UTXO set, the growth of the UTXO set is the block size. And so if you increase the block rate by especially that much, you can spam the UTXO set very, very badly. And I would argue what's been missed a lot in these discussions is that in Bitcoin, you can have temporary 51% attackers. They can censor transactions, but it's, they're always going to be challenged. They're always going to be challenged by anyone able to have, have hash rates anywhere in the world. And so they have to constantly be wasting energy to maintain the, the censorship. With time warp, in 40 days, they can take over the network or take down the network rather. So I think it really changes the security model of the, the 51% attacks. So I think we should, it would be good to fix it. Um, in terms of mitigation, the fix is obvious. Uh, the bug comes from the fact that there is enough by one in the retarget periods for the difficulty uh, adjustment. And the proposal from Matt from five years ago has taken into consideration the software that is already deployed by ASICs out there and just make it so this retarget periods actually overlap with, with trying to minimize the probability of a miner creating a, an invalid block, which is always what we're trying to do when we're designing a soft fork, uh, avoiding that stakeholders in, in the ecosystem lose money. Um, Okay, next, uh, just cut me, Mike, if I'm speaking too much. Uh, yeah, next, maybe, maybe before we go into the other issues, I'd like to add one little thing to the time warp attack. Um, so one of the issues is when the difficulty goes down, the interval between the blocks of, of obviously shrinks. And at some point, a single miner can so quickly create blocks that other miners um, are hampered significantly by the latency of receiving those blocks. And at that point, the network might actually start to diverge and no longer converge on a single uh, best chain, just because the frequency at which new blocks are churned out uh, becomes so high that others no longer um, receive them before the next one comes in and therefore cannot contribute mining power. And at that point, we might actually not have a single best chain, but many authors pushing out their own best chain because they never see the more work chain of other miners before they find their own. And uh, yeah, that it's a pretty bad catastrophe. Yeah, so uh, it is, and something I forgot to mention as well is uh, the political con uh, implications of exploiting the time warp. Uh, as someone say, it didn't come from me, but when I presented it to someone, this person told me, actually the miner would not take down the network. They have no incentive to do that. Rather, they would exploit a time warp to increase the block rate by, by like 10 persons, 20 persons. When they start doing that, they have, well, the miners have obviously an incentive to do that. They can sell more block space more rapidly. They can take more subsidy at, subsidy at the expense of future miners. And also a lot of the users have short-term incentives to enable the miners to do so because they would pay less fees. But it's at the long-term, um, well, it benefits everyone short-term, but it does not benefit everyone. It hurts everyone long term. So, because if miners start exploiting the time warp at, by, let's say, a 10 percent or 20 percent increase in the block rate, then we are always on the brink of <laughs> this cartel of miners being able to take down the network. Uh, so, that's so pretty bad as well. And if we want, and as as the subsidy exponentially decreases as well. 
the incentive for miners to try to use such techniques to increase their revenues gets more likely. So we, we would do good to, to address these issues before it gets messy politically to, to fix. Um, next, next bug. Uh, worst case block validation time. So this one is actually being discussed in uh, non-public channels. Well, at least the details of this are being, uh, being discussed. So I'm not going to expand too much. But basically, I could, came, I could come up with a block. So it's well known that we had blocks which took a long time in 2015 to validate. It was in 2015 they took a couple minutes to validate on low end machines or even mid mid range machines nowadays it is about a second to validate so i could come up with a block which today takes at least 3 minutes to validate with all the optimizations and the threading on my on my fairly modern laptop and which takes a hour and a half to validate on a raspberry pi and on a Raspberry Pi, not the low end Raspberry Pi, on the latest Raspberry Pi with the uh, SHA 256 specific instructions, the ARMv8 crypto set instruction for anyone who is interested. So that's not great. Uh, there is a few games that could be played by using large validation times. Obviously, but large validation times are bad because we want to make validation accessible. But in addition, Large validation times can be exploited by, for instance, by miners to get um, a head start in mining the next block over other miners. So again, it's another vector for mining centralization. And but it can also be played by lower miners. So miners can attack uh, each other using using uh, this attack. But you can also attack nodes. It's not clear how. For instance, if you have a lightning node running on top of your Bitcoin node, if your if your Bitcoin node is going to take ten minutes to validate a block and not be responsive, is the lightning node going to to bail out? If it bails out, are your channels still going to be watched? Um, and maybe there is other games that we don't know of. So just for these reasons, the details are not being discussed publicly. But obviously, it would be nice to reduce uh, the the worst case validation times, uh, there is always a trade-off between between how much you want to, redu to reduce the worst case and, and the confiscations that you want to impose and users of legacy uh, transactions. Uh, so yeah, that's a, there is a, a balance to strike and it's being discussed and once people are happy with one way of doing things, probably we're going to to post it on the public thread. Then there so is the infamous 64 base transactions. Uh, the Merkle trees, how the Merkle trees are computed in Bitcoin is absolutely broken. It's been broken in multiple ways and new ways have been found over time. Uh, the last two attacks with the, uh, on the Merkle tree of Bitcoin blocks uh, allow to fake the confirmation of a transaction, fake the inclusion of a payment in the Bitcoin blockchain uh, to an SPV verifier, or to fork a Bitcoin node which does not have some mitigations in place. So it works by either faking that a 64-byte transaction was included in a block so that you can give a Merkle proof down to this transaction or it works by having the concatenation of two tra two transactions which actually corresponds to a valid uh, ser serialization of a Bitcoin transaction. So in this case, you tell a node, here is a Bitcoin block, here is the Merkle tree for it, but it's not actually the right milk tree. It's a milk tree with some of the transactions in, in the block pruned. And the and the, the node is going to, to deserialize that. The milk tree is going to be valid. The milk proof is going to be valid. It's going to deserialize the transaction. Obviously, the transaction is going to be invaded 
and then it's going to discard the block. If the node, in order to not get dust, just caches that this block is invaded, by the time that he is going that it is going to receive the actual valid block with the same Merkle tree and the same Merkle proof, but a different set of transactions, and these transactions actually are valid, then uh, this node will already have cached the failure and that therefore will discard the valid block. And you've got a net split in this case. So in order to avoid this, Bitcoin Core does not cache the failure up until a certain point in the validation in the, of the block. But it would be nice if we could remove this foot gun uh, and if we could cache these failures, actually. Um, and for the SPV attack, it requires some, some brute force to execute this attack. However, as the difficulty increased uh, in the chain, in the main Bitcoin chain, this attack looks more and more cheaper compared to other SPV attacks that you can make on SPV verifiers. And keep in mind that it's not only uh, legacy SPV wallets out there that are verifying SPV proofs. It's, for instance, sidechains and, I don't know, whatever software could be verifying an SPV proof. It's not, it's very common. So there is also a simple mitigation in this case, which is to... Well, I'm not going to detail the mitigation, but there is a simple mitigation in both cases, both to fork off a node, the network of the network. There is a simple mitigation, just don't cache failures. Hey, it's not great, but at least can do that. And for SPV attacks, you can, you have a simple mitigation as well. Yet it would be good if we can make 64 bytes transactions invaded by consensus. So we don't have to deal with these foot guns anymore in the future and in case we find new attacks related to the market train. Finally, uh, I think we could afford including a fix to make Coinbase transactions actually unique. Uh, so it was found by Russell O'Connor back in, was it 2011? Yeah, 2011, I think, that in Bitcoin, the coin, two Coinbase transactions can be could be completely identical, uh, and therefore have the same TXID. And then, since the outputs of the transactions, which represent a coin which exists in the system, are referenced by TXID, this uh, causes issues, right? So with BIP thirty four, it was made. It was required that new Coinbase transactions include the block height for the blocks they are included in, in the script seek, in order to make them unique. So new Coinbase transactions are unique. However, there were plenty of uh, Coinbase transactions before BIP34 activated, uh, which could be duplicated in the future in theory. Uh, it's very theoretical, but it would be after around block 2 million, the block height 2 million. So it's it's still far away, but still it would make sense that we make Bitcoin transactions unique. <laughs> um, so Yeah, I guess that's it. I, I have a question that sort of um, comes up with this. Um, when you duplicate a Coinbase transaction from the past, obviously you have to replicate all the outputs on that Coinbase transaction as well. In particular, the uh, Coinbase for block 1,900,300 and whatever, um, it, it pays out something like 100 Bitcoins to a given set of recipients of that Coinbase. Um, assuming that in 15 to 20 years, Bitcoin is still around and um, potentially given the limited supply is very, very valuable. What what could an attacker achieve by duplicating this Coinbase transaction while paying money to the same people that mined the block like 10 years ago? Yeah, it would be costly to, to do that. Also, it's possible that it's not even 
deplicable because well then what you can do is to spend the transaction uh, with the same transaction as uh, the original Coinbase transaction was spent at and you can uh, forget what the attack in, in, in Russell first was but I think it has to deal with how Bitcoin Core would change uh, would uh, update its UTXO set upon reorgs uh, that if there is a reorg we would reapply the new Coinbase and not the original Coinbase or something like that uh, I don't remember exactly Right. And so the fix for that would be to either require that Coinbase transactions in the future also put the lock time in the uh, the height in the lock time, which uh, previously no transactions, no Coinbase transactions that are um, that have height strings in them. Uh, they had all zero, I think, in the time lock. Or the alternative is to require that they do a witness commitment, aka that these specific blocks are must be SegWit blocks. Um, yeah. Yeah, both both work. Uh, originally, I was more in favor of using the of making it mandatory to have a witness commitment in the output of the transaction of the Coinbase transaction because it's an already something that miners do, and it seems like the most backward compatible change compared to having to update to, to new templates, which would put the unlock time, the, the block height in the unlock time. But it's also it's also at a block height to million. So it's, it's the whole uh, lifetime of Bitcoin again in, in the future. So I feel like we could just do the obvious thing and require that the block height be put in the end lock time and call it today. I, I think the backward compatibility concern is lesser given the time before it would be activated. And yeah, the advantage here would be, of course, that whether or not someone mines an empty block or uh, doesn't include any SegWit transactions or anything like that, uh, the lock time is already a field on the Coinbase transaction that has previously not been used. So uh, requiring that the Coinbase transaction commit to the height in the lock time would be um, probably the least restriction that obviously breaks with the past transactions. Antoine, you started a wish list on, on delving and, and you got into that with uh, the BIP30, BIP34 discussion here. Uh, have there been other wish list items that you've considered or that others have considered adding? I've not, well, nobody suggested anything that I would consider relevant yet. Would, uh, isn't there like the, the 20 year 2106 timestamp uh, issue? Maybe that's not soft fork solvable. Well, yeah, we could, I didn't consider it because it's so far in the future. Uh, I could look into it. I honestly didn't even consider it at all. What's feedback been on both the delving post or any feedback that you've gotten outside of, of delving on reviving this? I think I not sniped a couple of people into figuring out what's the worst block validation time. Uh, so I think that's good feedback. And in general, I think a few people think it's valuable to have uh, not insane block validation times, unique coin bases, uh, fixing time warp. So I, I did not receive any bad feedbacks on the concept, let's say. And maybe maybe to follow up on, on that comment, so w what stopped this from moving along previously? Uh, I don't know, someone picking it up. All right. Well, good thing that we have you now. <laughs> yeah, let's let's see how well the research is going before before proposing anything. But yeah, um, maybe a meta question: how, how did you find yourself working on this particular issue or, or curiosity? I know we've had you on talking about a bunch of different things previously, so I'm wondering how you found yourself here. <laughs> I don't know. I just figured it was uh, an. In a valuable thing that nobody was working on and it was worth 
investigating. Yeah, we absolutely should work on this. Um, as Antoine already said earlier, the time warp attack is actually pretty horrible. Uh, we would see that it starts to happen by just a huge number of blocks starting to backdate uh, miners backdating their blocks and then we would only have something like four weeks as a community to react with a soft fork that fixes the issue and I think um, just the short timeline that we would be forced into and seeing how <laughs> nice seg here how other um, processes for which we don't really have any good decision mechanisms uh, take, I don't think that <laughs> wanting to deploy a soft fork to fix an impending doom in four weeks is a particularly nice um, prospect. Yeah, and also, right, what is the, what do you draw the line between deploying a soft fork in four weeks and users coordinating to decide which chain is the valid one? So I think it I think this this is also something that people have been saying, yeah, time warp will be obvious if it's exploited. We can just, who is we? <laughs> and can, I'm, I'm not sure. So I, I think if Bitcoin users need to coordinate to choose the valid chain, it loses a lot of its value proposition. So yeah, we should, we should fix it in advance. Really excited to see you working on this, Antoine. Any final words for the audience before we move on? Yeah, a plug for my wallet, try Liana wallet. I just released version five. And I guess that, that's it. And uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's it. Uh, keep it, uh, keep your, yourself informed with the, the great consensus cleanup. I'll keep you guys updated on the, on the public posts uh, with new advancements. Thanks for joining us, Antoine. Go ahead, Merch. Sorry, I was just saying, very sneaky ad here. I almost didn't notice it. Um, yeah, Mike, go ahead. <laughs> Antoine, you're, you're welcome to hang out with us if you have other things to do. We understand. Thanks for opining. Next news item titled, Choosing New BIP Editors. Now, Merch, we covered your follow-up in the thread about adding new BIP editors on the mailing list. Maybe for a quick recap, for the last... Six weeks or so, there's been discussion on the mailing list about adding new BIP editors. Um, some of the backstory there is that Kale and Luke were editors for the last several years. And recently, folks have expressed some frustration with the BIP process. And somewhat around that time frame, um, Kale stepped down as a BIP editor, leaving Luke as the only BIP editor. And then recently, Luke posted on Twitter about... 133 pull requests open to the BIPs repository and looking for volunteers to help. And then there was a mailing list post that sort of kicked off the discussion. There's been a lot of discussion on that email thread on the mailing list with a bunch of proposed candidates and, and how to think about um, endorsing a candidate. I'll pause there. Merch, I know you followed up in the thread sort of trying to, to move the process along a little bit and trying to make a decision or, or a few decisions by, I guess, tomorrow. What's, what's the status of that? Yeah, so uh, a couple people had concerns about the timeline. Apparently 10 days is uh, not enough time. And the, um, there's a core developer meeting coming up. So people wanted to space it away from that a bit so that the decision would gen definitely be made in public. Um, well, that that's all fine. Uh, as you already said, the um, there had been a bit of a frustration with the bit process for a while. I I would um, uh, perceive the timeline slightly different. It's been a high friction process for a very very long time to the point that um, the treasure people made their slips in a separate process. The lightning bolts, which could have been BIPs, uh, have their own, um, well, specification process and, and repository. Uh, three months ago, finally, AJ opened the banana repository to, to 
basically of, offer a parallel institution where you can publish documents for public consumption and discussion. Uh, so, yeah, and I mean, it, it was a high friction process three years ago, which was why Color was added as another editor in the first place. So it's it's just been almost forever that it's been like that. My intent here was now, given the, the friction and also just the broad agreement between uh, people consuming the BIP repository, people writing for the BIP repository or contributing to it, and the current BIP editor all saying that it would be great to have more help. And then like the, the discussion on the mailing list just fizzling out. It seemed like it needed to be restarted, so I, I guess I uh, I made a shot from the hip and said, "How about we just try to set an end date for this discussion and see what happens until then, and then we can try something else." Sort of inspired by uh, the way we tried to deploy Taproot, uh, speedy a speedy trial, and just try something for a while, so we are better informed to potentially try something else anyway um what happened is basically the same thing that happens in open source when there's no clear um authority on a matter and no clear decision process or process in general we do not have a process on how the BIP editors are selected so um everybody has an opinion uh nobody wants to to make any decisions or can make any decisions so i hope that maybe by the end of the month we we can just um interpret what all has been said on the repository sorry on the mailing list and then maybe agree on how it is interpreted and make a decision or yeah well rough consensus is hard when you're all in a room but it's even harder on a mailing list or in a diffuse community situation so my hope would generally be it would just be good to be able to uh, have the central place where we can publish ideas and proposals for um, how we want to work on the bitcoin protocol i think it's more important that we can actually have access to, like the proof of work is already in the documents themselves. The documents have to be formatted correctly, have to be comprehensive. They have to fill out a bunch of different sections like backwards compatibility. And um, otherwise, they're not going to merge just for formal reasons. I don't think that we have to make it much harder than that to prevent spam. And um, maybe as a separate discussion and it should be two separate discussions uh, one being whether or not we add editors and who those editors are going to be and the second discussion being whether the bit process in itself might need some reform but in my opinion it might be better to be a little more um, progress focused and merging stuff a little quicker and then in the uh, consumption of the documents, assess them rather than trying to to gatekeep proposals that some people might think are a bad idea or are not clearly a a great move forward. And um, yeah, it, it might be just nice to take the personal assessment of the editors out of that a little bit. There's been a bunch of people who have been nominated by others, and there's some folks who have also self-nominated to be BIP editors. I don't know, Merch. It sounds like I, I want to be a banana maintainer. I want to be a banana editor because you just see if it's spam and then you merge it, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm self-nominating self banana editor. AJ, I see, I see you in here. Let's make it happen. Um, Merch, do you, do you think it's worth informing people maybe at a high level of what the editor responsibilities are? I think maybe some people can over or underestimate like what that is stated to be responsibilities, or do you think that's getting too much in the weeds? Um, I, I've uh, recently consumed BIP2 again, which sets out the BIP process, and I find that it is 
a little vague and leaves a lot of ambiguity in certain parts. For example, it requires that BIPs are about Bitcoin and stick to the general philosophy of Bitcoin. And um, like who assesses whether or not an idea is uh, in adherence with the philosophy of Bitcoin? I, I, I feel that is a very difficult point to assess because basically there's as many opinions on what exactly Bitcoin is as there's users. And um, yeah, the, the other one is that it has to be technical sound, technically sound and a like good idea. But then the process document also states um, that even if it might not get accepted or be considered broadly a good idea, it should still get merged. So there, there's just a few points there that could be a little clearer. So what the BIP editors do is they uh, are asked to, to assess pull requests to the repository and ensure that everything is formatted correctly and complete. And then I guess BIP2 also requires them to make some sort of technical assessment and philosophical assessment of the proposed idea. And I think this, as well as um, the number assignment, has been a little bit of a bottleneck. If you're curious about this, jump into the Bitcoin Dev mailing list and you can view also the archives on the Google group. Um, fairly active discussion. A lot of people have opinions on that. Um, I think we can probably wrap that up. Oh, Merch, you have an opinion. Go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to jump in on something else that you touched on that I forgot to mention just now, which was um, there's been a few people that have been nominated and a few people that have self-nominated. I think that it is generally not a job that a lot of people want to do because there's 138 open pull requests, uh, probably a lot of work in the next half year or so at least to to go through that and merge and clean out and try to get in touch with a bunch of people that haven't contributed to Bitcoin in a decade and, and, and. So I don't know if we, like, in a way, it's already a bit of a red flag if people want to do the job. But um, yeah, we it would be great if we maybe added another three to five people to this job so we could make progress. Next section from the newsletter, releases and release candidates. We have three. First one, Bitcoin Core 26.1 being released. And we, we link to the release notes that I have up in front of me. But I don't know if it makes sense to go, go through these. There's a lot of minutia here. Merch, do you maybe have a TLDR on fixes in here other than encouraging folks to upgrade? I, I think we've talked about 26.1 two or three times already. And once we went into the details and then after that, we've referred to the previous ones. Um, it's just a couple bug fixes. Like, for example, um, there's this issue with subtract fee from output. It's, it's stuff that doesn't get hit very often. There's uh, things that are more concerning maybe that a cookie file is not generated and so forth but there's just if you if you really care and you're deploying back-end software that has to work that you have to be compatible with your integration with and you depend on all your money um, in in a business context I think yes you should go through the release notes and in detail understand the changes but um, for most people, they will probably not notice a difference. It's just a few bug fixes. And perhaps for our audience, we linked to the release notes and there are PR numbers categorized by um, type of changes. So you may just be technically curious about what are some of these changes that went into 26.1. So click through and into those to satisfy your curiosity there. Bitcoin Core 27.0, release candidate one. This is basically a duplicate of our entry from last week. And we went through the testing guide in more detail last week. So I would refer listeners back to that to, to get a bit more detail and um, a guide for them to go through 27.0 if they want to poke around. 
Anything to add there, Merch? Nope. I think uh, we d- dove deep into that one last week. Last release candidate is HWI 3.0.0, release candidate 1. I pinged a chow before this space is kicked off. And she noted that, that this was really just changing the default behavior to not detect emulators. And thus, the, the version bump is required because uh, semantic versioning says to do that for breaking changes. So that's all I'm aware of for this particular release candidate. I don't know if you knew more merch. No, I, I've just looked at the commits since tw- 2.4, which we talked about, I think, a month ago or so, roughly. Um, and... Yeah, it, it sounds like um, people that are working with the HWI as a development tool will notice a difference. And yes, breaking changes require the bump on the major version. So this is 3.0 for the emulator. As we move to notable code changes, I'll take the opportunity. I see Antoine is still here. If you're curious about some of the consensus cleanup work that he talked about, feel free to chime in uh, and request speaker access. Similar uh, for these release candidates or the BIP editor's news item earlier. Bitcoin Core 27307 begins tracking TXIDs of transactions in the mempool that conflict with a transaction belonging to the built-in wallet. Merch, I saw that you were one of, one of the reviewers on this particular PR. Maybe it would make sense for you to explain the motivation for, for tracking these things. Yeah, I guess we were previously not super explicitly um, keeping track of what exactly the problem was with a conflicted transaction. So a conflicted transaction in the first place is a transaction that spends the same inputs as another transaction. And if we have one of those in our wallet, for example, because we RBF'd something or, um, yeah, well, let's say we have two instances of the same wallet, which you should never do, and the other wallet RBF'd something, then we might see this as a conflict on on our wallet and now with this explicit tracking of the mempool conflicts we previously didn't distinguish whether it was a conflict with something that was still unconfirmed in the mempool or uh, confirmed in the blockchain as cleanly and now this is all sussed out so for example when you make a get transaction call for a wallet transaction you will see which transaction exactly something conflicts with and um, it'll properly count any other inputs that are no longer spent because the transaction is being conflicted already as spendable and counts them towards the balance. So it's um, maybe removing a bunch of the quirks people that have used RBF before with multiple input transactions um, and cleans up basically stuff in the back end about uh, tracking conflicting transactions. And, and right now, as as a user, I would see this field if I'm calling the get transaction RPC, but there's nothing in uh, the GUI at this time. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I think it's not shown in the GUI. It would only show on the RPC, and um, it would be empty, of course, for most transactions because there's no conflict in the mempool. But specifically, if you had an, a transaction that got pushed out of the mempool by a conflict. For example, if someone else paid you and then RBF their transaction to instead pay the money back to themselves, then you would see it in your wallet because your wallet had picked up the first one as a recipient. Uh, You would see now that this transaction got redirected and there's a conflict and you would learn the TX ID. So it's, it's, um, yeah. Next PR, Bitcoin Core 29242, which adds RBF diagram checks for single chunks against clusters of size 2. Maybe to begin, what is a diagram check, Merch? Okay, so y'all have probably heard about cluster mempool at this point. The general idea there is that we do not track transactions only in the context of their ancestries when we assess what should be in the mempool and uh, what should be picked into blocks, but we rather uh, track transactions in the clusters they form where cluster is all the transactions that are connected via 
child and parent relationships transitively. So um, it could be you start with a transaction and then the parent of that, the child of that, the parent of the new child and so forth. All, everything that is connected in any way forms one cluster. The big advantage of this new approach is that we um, can sort the mining order inside of the cluster fairly easily. Uh, we can definitely do this uh, optimally for clusters of up to 20 transactions, and we can do it greedily for transactions easily up to 100, sorry, clusters with up to 100 transactions. And then by basically just comparing the orders in all of the clusters, we get something akin to a total order in the mempool. And that allows us to remove transactions when we're um, purging, for example, because the mempool overflows uh, in exactly the opposite order in which we're mining. So we pick from the front of these clusters to mine. And when we discard transactions due to the mempool running full, we discard from the end of the clus clusters in the order that we would mine them last. So um, how do we sort stuff in the uh, mempool, well, we sort of make the optimal fee rate diagram in a cluster. We sort transactions in the cluster such that the front of the cluster has the most fees and the end of the cluster has the least fees added. And of course, we respect topology. And uh, it turns out that when we use these fee rate diagrams, um, which really is just fee over weight of transactions, we can compare different clusters with each other. And if one of the fee rate diagrams is always the same or higher than the other fee rate diagram, it is just up, um, obviously better than that fee rate diagram. So we can use this as a um, cleaner assessment of whether or not a replacement should be accepted or not than the BIP 125 rules, which are um, a little harder to assess and can sometimes lead to cases in which we accept transactions that make the mempool worse, at least in some dimensions. So it, it's we use this, or in the context of a cluster mempool proposal, we use the fee rate diagram as the new mechanism of ass assessing mempool incentive compatibility. <laughs> that was a mouthful. Okay, so... Uh, this PR basically adds utility functions to allow us to compare two different clusters with the fee rate diagram checks. And then specifically, it adds another utility function that allows us to check whether a replacement that would replace a, um, up to two transactions is better than the original content of the mempool. And if that's the case, Hopefully soon when um, another follow-up PR will be merged, we will start applying this for the assessment of clusters with two transactions, which will allow us to opportunistically relay transactions in the context like one child and one parent uh, packages via stashing something in the orphanage. So you would see the child first, see, oh, I don't know the parent, stuff it in the orphanage, and when you then ask the peer that gave you the child transaction, hey, can you give me the parent too? You would, instead of assessing the parent only as a singular transaction and potentially fail it because individually it doesn't have a high enough fee rate, you would uh, be able to assess it as a package with the child from the orphanage and the newly arrived parent. And um, you would even be allowed to RBF because we now have uh, comparison rules that allow us to assess whether the replacement has a better mempool incentive compatibility, and then we accept it. Okay, did you catch all that? Mempool's wild, huh? It's it's um it's the heart piece of the of how everything ties together in the Bitcoin Core client, and it is, has pretty complicated logic. There's sort of a lot of assumptions that are not explicitly stated in there. And honestly, it actually gets a lot cleaner and more well-defined with cluster mempool. So yeah, pretty excited about the work there. 
In the write-up for this PR, we link to Suhas's post on mempool incentive compatibility, which is on Delving, um, which also has some example um, fee rate diagrams that we talked about. And it, it, there's like a visual way to see some of what um, we're talking about here. And that may help listeners sort of put a, a visual to it. Uh, and then maybe... I don't know if we've talked about this, maybe just briefly, but Merch, what is a truck transaction? Okay, so we, we've heard about V3 transactions before, and um, V3 transactions is sort of naming the concept after an implementation detail. Um, so yes, uh, these transactions will be labeled with version 3, and they will... Um, opt into a topological restriction. So a V3 transaction will only be able to have one child or one parent. And if it has a parent, it can only have 1000 uh, V bytes in size. So um, basically it forces clusters to be only a size of two. You cannot make V3 transactions or insert V3 transactions in bigger clusters. And that makes a lot of the complexity of package relay and package RBF manageable. Uh, for example, in the context of the PR we just discussed, we have already all the tools to assess the comparison of two clusters of tr transaction size too. So truck transactions is the concept based name uh, topologically restricted until confirmation. Uh, when you label a transaction with version three, you opt in that it is restricted to this two transaction cluster topology. And in exchange for that, you probably have the, um, you cannot be pinned as easily and therefore it will be much easier for you to reprioritize your transaction. Mm -hmm. We assume that this will be, for example, useful in Lightning, where uh, a commitment transaction uh, has a, is time sensitive and we need to be able to close channels in a timely fashion. And then a transaction that, for example, spends an anchor output would be fairly small and we would only allow a single child. And then uh, we talked about sibling eviction, I think last week or two weeks ago. So in the context of a commit, uh, commitment transaction with one or one anchor, two anchors, or ephemeral anchors, or whatever, if someone else makes a second child to this V3 transaction parent, we would allow the better, the more mempool incentive compatible child to to pers uh, be persisted, even if it's not actually spending exactly the same input. So. Generally, this is basically the start of us having um, actual package relay, the start of package relay on mainnet. And just to be clear, this is not for the 27 release. This is going to come in the 28 release, hopefully, which is about six and a half months away. Thanks, Merch. Core Lightning 7094, which removes multiple features previously deprecate, deprecated. And we made reference to the deprecation scheme that we talked about in newsletter 288, which was Core Lightning 6936. And that was the PR that introduced a deprecations markdown file for keeping track of deprecations. And it also introduced this funny named option in Core Lightning, which is I hyphen promise hyphen to fix broken API user. Uh, and it's an option that allows folks if they forgot or didn't see that certain features that they were using were deprecated and that feature was then removed. There's a one version sort of grace period in Core Lightning where you could use that I promise flag and uh, provide a feature name and that feature will be turned on for, for that release. Um, so that was in, uh, in, in response to users of Core Lightning um, maybe not paying attention to deprecation or, or sort of not addressing that deprecation and, and then all of a sudden that feature being gone. So there's sort of this one release grace period. Uh, and that was 6936 that introduced that scheme. And this Core Lightning PR this week uh, actually removes a bunch of features that have been going through that three release deprecation scheme for Core Lightning. I saw that 
there was about 4,100 lines of code removed with this pull request. So I bet that feels good for the, the core lightning team to remove all of that old code. And last PR this week, BDK 1351, which formally defines that project's stop gap variable as, quote, the maximum number of consecutive unused addresses, unquote. And so not only did they define that gap um, definition, but they also then made related code changes across the repository to reflect that definition. So that gap variable is used in BDK when their full scan function is called. And in this PR's case, uh, that scan function is going against Explora to find transactions related to that user's wallet. So if there's no uh, transactions related to addresses for stop gap number of addresses, then it'll stop that, that, that scan. So, you know, essentially if you're running a web shop, you're using BDK, potentially users will generate um, a payment address and you'll use a unique address for every checkout on your site, say. And if a bunch of people abandon their carts after you've generated uh, addresses, uh, potentially you could hit that gap limit depending on what that is. It could be hundreds, could be thousands. And it's it's essentially just a scheme so that, because in theory you could generate indefinite, you know, uh, maybe near infinite number of addresses. So you don't want to just keep churning through scanning for those. So the gap limit is sort of a uh, a limit to that that BDK has put in place. They, they actually had that in place already, but they've redefined what that means. Uh, and as part of the write-up for this PR this week, we've also included a gap limit topic on the Optic Wiki as well. Merch, did you get a chance to jump into that BDK PR? Or do you have any further comments on on gap limit conceptually or more generally? Uh, I did not look at the PR directly. I think generally you should use probably gaps of at least greater than 100, maybe 1,000. And then most of the problems that people have had headaches about for gaps will just go away for you. I didn't see any other questions. Antoine, I saw you had some some follow-up in uh, the thread. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, maybe if that's... Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Uh, you, you were speaking, then muted, now you're back. Okay, yeah, because I don't see it on the UI. Okay, yeah, maybe it's that's interested to people. Uh, so I refreshed my memory about the original attack, and I also realized that it was not the question that Merch was asking. So Merch asked if there is going to be a duplicate of a Coinbase transaction in the future, what would happen? So what would happen is that the block would be invaded because if we don't do anything else, Bitcoin Core is going to perform still the BIP30 validation, which is a little bit expensive. It requires to go through the whole list of transactions in the block before processing it and verifying that none of these transactions already exists as in the UTXO set. It means that you can have a duplicate if all of its outputs have been spent in the past. So the, the rule for BIP30 is that no, there exists no unspent transaction uh, with the same TX ID. Then, uh, just to add a little bit of history, maybe I can talk about the original attack described by uh, Russell O'Connell in his overheating economy uh, posts which was actually in 2012. I was wrong again on this one, uh, not in 2011. And so the original attack is that if you can override a Coinbase transaction in the past, you can override the height, uh, the confirmation height of the UTX server. So Coinbase transactions cannot be spent before 100 blocks, but you can override the the idea of a transaction which spends the Coinbase transaction as well. So let's say you have a, you have a, a transaction A which was confirmed 200,000 blocks ago. So you can think it's pretty reliable. Uh, this transaction is itself spent 
by thousands of future transactions in uh, future blocks, well, which are past blocks from now, but later blocks. Um, and what you can do by rewriting the Coinbase transaction and therefore this transaction is just to recreate the UTXO and the UTXO set, but with the new confirmation height. And then you can, if you manage to reorg, to do a one block reorg and unconfirm this transaction or replace it with a, a conflicting tr transaction, you, you've effectively invalidated these transactions, which had to a hundreds of thousands of confirmation and all the transactions that's depending, depended on it. As Russell notes in his post, so it's not really an incentive for the attacker to do that. It's just, yeah, nobody, even if there is no incentive for it, nobody should be able to and confirm your transaction. So basically by first remining the same Coinbase transaction, then reorging out the block, you could uh, delete the people's ability to spend the outputs from the original transaction in case, um, wait, no, if, if there had been any left, BIP30 would have blocked it. So you, you only remove the old transaction and only on the people that saw the reorg. So yeah. it you might be a net just, split? Um, no, no, you can't do anything anymore. Uh, you, with BIP30, you can't exploit this attack anymore. This attack was closed with BIP30, and then people realized, well, maybe instead of performing this expensive BIP30 validation, what if we made Coinbase transaction unique? And then they created BIP34 to make the Coinbase transactions unique. But then, actually, you can still duplicate Coinbase transactions from before BIP34 activated. Right, so this attack seems altogether fairly theoretical, but it's just some sort of shit fuckery that we shouldn't want to have in our chain. And yeah. therefore, it's uh, pretty reasonable that we should, some at some point in the next 15 years, fix that. Yes, and it's not, it's a, it's not only, uh, it would not be, well, at least if I were to propose any soft fork, I wouldn't include it on the ground that it's just nicer. It also allows to reduce the expense, well, to avoid the expensive BIP30 validations that we have to do for every single block after block height 1,900, no, 1 million and 900,000, which is the case on testnet. On testnet, we went back to performing full BIP30 validation. And on, on mainnet, we still have the optimization that there is no Coinbase duplicate possible before before block 2 million, basically. So we still do not perform the BIP30 validation, but in 15 years, we are going to have to go back to performing full BIP30 validation if we don't make Coinbase Unix uh, before then. Yeah, sounds sounds reasonable to instead require lock times or something. Shit fuckery. Now we're going to get the explicit tag on our podcast. Thanks, Merch. Hey, that'll only increase our listeners. It might people just be curious why why is this why is the optic recap explicit? Um, all right, I didn't see any other questions. Antoine, thank you for being our special guest and and sticking around. Merch, thanks always to to co-hosting with me, and thank you all for listening.